Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We're going to do something a little bit different today. There is a new book out today, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace by John Avlon. And if you recognize the name, John is senior political analyst and anchor at CNN uh, and the author of this new book, which John Meacham describes this way. Avalon is a master of the art of finding the universal in the particular. He sheds new light on the most tangled questions of our history, not least the tragedy of Reconstruction. With its graceful prose and wise insights, this is an important and absorbing contribution to the literature of the American presidency. And John Avalon joins me now on the podcast. Hey, Charlie. How do you top that? We should just stop I, right there, right? I, I mean, mean, you know, when when I when I read that gracious uh, <laughs> blurb, I you know could have knocked me yeah. over. It was that that that's one you want to you want to take with you. Um, it was it was very generous and deeply appreciated, and I hope everyone loves the book as much. Uh, well, here's my the basic question, and, and you you mentioned this in your introduction. There there have been something like sixteen thousand books uh, written about <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. So I guess the question is. Why one more? Why would, you know, what, why did you write this book? Why some damn fool like you? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, look, I, I obviously we're, we're Lincoln endures. Uh, he has this gravitational pull in the American psyche. Uh, I think particularly during the presidency of Donald Trump when I wrote this book. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I believe you, you, the rule I've always used with my books are you should write the book you want to read. Mm -hmm. And I found myself being very drawn again to Lincoln, not only because he presided over the country in a far more divided time, but because as a matter of character and the essential qualities of his character were so opposite from what we'd seen exhibited in the White House at the time. And then I found a quote by the general Lucius Clay, mm -hmm. who oversaw the occupation of Germany after the Second World War. And Clay was a has been a somewhat forgotten figure, but um, really he oversaw what is was known at the time and is still known as the good occupation. He was the son of a three-term uh, Georgia senator, uh, born 30 years after the Civil War. And somebody asked him, what guided your decisions during the occupation? And he said, I tried to think of what Abraham Lincoln would have done for the South if he had lived. And that opened up a whole, uh, just a, a series of questions became the seed of the book because one of the themes is how do you win a peace? And so I went around and as I developed this idea about Lincoln's plan to win the peace after winning the war, his vision for national reconciliation and reunification, I reached out to a number of Lincoln scholars just to say, you know, I have this idea, has it been done before? Am I stretching? Is this a waste of my time? Is there enough there? And I remember I was actually standing in the Abraham Lincoln bookstore in Chicago, talking to the owner, Daniel Weinberg. And I asked him that. He looked around at all these shelves. I mean, thousands of Lincoln hmm. books. And, and he said, you know, I'll be darned. I don't think anyone's done a book just on Lincoln, the peacemaker. And by the way, there's a perfectly logical reason why. I mean, sure. he has assassinated five days after Appomattox. He never has a chance to implement his vision. So this really is one of history's great what ifs, right? What if he would have lived? It is. It, well, it's the unfinished symphony. I, I don't. I don't indulge in a lot of what if because that's kind of a fun parlor mm -hmm. game, but it doesn't really doesn't really benefit mm -hmm. anything or anyone. Um, but but I do think what you can do, what Lincoln left us is enough. If you trace his language, you know his intentions, his vision from the second inaugural, because the book really focuses on the last six weeks of his life from the second inaugural through his last speech, which is a somewhat legalistic vision of, of, of the, what he wanted to guide Reconstruction, and all his conversations in between with you know, General Sherman and Grant and Porter on the River Queen uh, that became, in essence, uh, the, the, the terms dictated by Grant to Lee at Appomattox, you can really sketch out a fairly complete version of what he intended. And that itself, I think, has transcendent value. And it is extraordinary because, of course, you know, Abraham Lincoln was one of America's great warlords, presided over w one of the, if not the bloodiest, um, the bloodiest war, what, 750,000 yeah. um, Americans dead, you point out. If you laid the coffins end to end, they would have stretched from New York to Atlanta. And yet, and yet he had this instinct, this belief about what needed to be done, you know, and you quote him, you know, we must extinguish our resentments if we expect harmony and union and if I were in your place, I'd let him up easy, let him up easy. This is the the advice. 
So tell me a little bit about, you know, Abraham Lincoln's character. How do you go through all of that trauma, all of that bloodshed and that horror and then decide, OK, we're you know, we're, we're, we're going to step away from that. We are going to we're going to embrace sort of fundamental redemption and decency, because that's not as we're living through a period right now. That is not the instinct of a lot of people in politics or in government. Not at all. The normal human instinct is to seek revenge. But a leadership focused on reconciliation, which is what Lincoln virtually invents, um, is predicated upon the opposite. It's it's really New Testament leadership. It, it's it's uh, to, to love your enemies. Um, it is to understand uh, what Dr. Martin Luther King said a century later, you know, which you don't defeat hate with hate, you defeat hate with love. Um, and, and of course, it is contrary to, to all our instincts, but it was Lincoln's example in that front in particular that made him such a worldwide hero. And he was a man of peace in a time of war. Um, you know, he was always urging his generals to be more aggressive on the battlefield, but as a matter of his personality, and I try to really distill this, um, he is defined by an absence of malice. Uh, I think his personality is defined by empathy and honesty and humor and humility. And out of those core qualities come his principles, which are then reflected in his politics and his policies. And so he was really holding himself to a higher, some might say the highest standard and trying to lead by example, not just the words, um, where the second inaugural's last paragraph is a perfect encapsulation of his vision after what really was a very Old Testament speech before that New Testament last turn, but in his actions. And that's why I spent so much time focusing on what he did in the last six, six weeks of his life, his trip to the front lines, his visit to Richmond after the fall, which is the opening scene of the book that you just quoted from, his comforting wounded Confederate and Union soldiers alike in field hospitals. That's a powerful example, a powerful well, message. And, and you describe also the, the role of his character. To be a peacemaker, it helps to be humble. Lincoln understood that arrogance could lead to overextension and a misjudgment of one man's capacity to control events. Humility takes into account human nature and human frailty. I'm, I'm, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, writing this book during this current period must have been kind of an extraordinary experience because we're not seeing a lot of humility <laughs> in our politics. No. Um, and, and, and coming home to, to, to Lincoln to work on this book after running reporters yeah. covering the Trump campaign in Trump right. White House when I was editor in chief of the Daily Beast or covering it at CNN, it was medicine. Mm -hmm. It was a reminder that it, it doesn't need to be this way and that we have had leaders who appealed to the better angels of our nature and that it was hard. And we've been through far more divided times before. And that's part of, I think, what, what is, I hope, redemptive and exciting about this book for people. You know, defending democracy can be just as heroic as winning it in the first place. And that what Lincoln was able to do, moral humility in particular, which is a quality, you know, obviously it's the opposite of I alone can fix it. But that is, is really an essential quality for peacemaking. You know, what, what Lincoln was able to do is balance his moderation you know, I believe he was a reconciler in a time of radicals and reactionaries with moral courage. He didn't think that moral courage, though, bestowed upon him moral superiority. And so there was always this emphasis on persuasion, upon understanding your opponent as a means of reasoning with him. And that's the most difficult thing uh, to do in our politics right now. And I think we need to be honest that our, our empathy has been tested. It is being tested, mm -hmm. even if that's your intention. Because there are so many bad faith actors, frankly, uh, we've elevated, you know, sort of being a troll to to a, you know, a, a an art form, um, and that strains our ability to to reason together. But that's where the example of a Lincoln, I think, can inspire us, and why there's such an urgent need to remember this example right now. It's a challenge to all of us. So there's a certain complexity to this, which is that, you know, many of his Republican allies, the people who were the strongest advocates for restoring, um, you know, African-American rights, uh, uh, the abolitionists uh, were suspicious of him, weren't they? They thought he was squishy. They thought he was too timid. They wanted <laughs> to be more aggressive. And of course, we saw this play out in, in Reconstruction that, in fact, um, you needed to uh you know, aggressively affirm the rights of many of the former slaves 
give me your sense though of of of, of how how Lincoln would have squared that circle. How do you go about the extraordinary business of restoring the rights of an enslaved people at the same time you are reconciling with the slave masters, the slaveholders who you just defeated? Well, I, I think you 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 set clear goals. Um, you're uncompromising about your pursuit of those goals, but very flexible on the details. So let me explain what I mean. Um, I, you know, I believe that Lincoln's prescription for peacemaking is very clear. It's unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. And what, you know, he really focuses on, he has three indispensable goals that he presents to Confederates who at peace negotiations on the River Queen and then in Richmond. Um, and he writes them out in his own hand. And, and one is essentially a, a recognition of federal authority. The Union must be respected. The South must reenter the Union and abide by the Constitution. The second is an end to slavery for all time. And by the end of the war, that's virtually, it's assumed that the war has, has done a lot, even with the 13th Amendment still open for ratification. But finally, and I think most interestingly, he insists that there must be no, there can be no ceasefire before surrender. And that's a critical point because there's so many people who are urging on him, you know, they want peace at all costs, right. even during the war at the expense of slavery and, and, and a permanent partition of the Union. But he refuses that. He's so concerned that if there's a ceasefire before surrender, there will be backsliding on the end of slavery. And, right. and this is where I, I think you see the real strength of, you know, I call him a soulful centrist, but the, the, the strength combined with mercy, it's that balance. And, uh, you know, from the abolitionist perspective, as you say, and, and, and Frederick Douglass says perfectly, he said, you know, viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But he said, measuring by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. And that speaks to, I think, the line he had to walk and walked so well. He believed that decency could be the most powerful form of politics, but he understood that people needed to be greeted from a position of strength for that to work. And he set up a structure in order to make his vision succeed. And that, of course, would be the just peace that he said must follow yes. a just war. Yeah. So five days after Lee surrenders, he is he is assassinated. And as you point out, this was the first assassination of a president in American history, which is worth remembering because a lot of us grew up during a period when assassinations appeared to be more common. And, you know, what a shock it was. And then he is succeeded by the man you call the anti-Lincoln. And I just want to just back up for a moment that about half your book is post Lincoln and talks about, you know, there may have been you no know, failures in the near term, but you look at the broad sweep of history and argue that there was a vindication of his vision, but short term, he was, he was replaced by somebody who was about as opposite him in terms of character and philosophy as you can imagine. Uh, Andrew Johnson. So why do you call Andrew Johnson the anti-Lincoln? <laughs> Be, because he is is the opposite of Lincoln in everything except his humble beginnings. I mean, just it, it's a reminder that the core quality in a president that matters is character, and and with that, without that, nothing matters. Nothing else matters. But I mean, just over and over again, you see that you know Lincoln was steady and selfless, and Johnson's erratic and egotistical. He, he's radical and reactionary. And the and the, the Atlantic describes him in, in this phrase I find so resonant to what we have recently been through in our country. He does. They describe him as Johnson as egotistic to the point of mental disease. Yeah. Insincere as well as stubborn, cunning as well as unreasonable, vain as well as ill-tempered. So it's rooted in a question of of his personality. So it's just that basic. Um, but it's 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 you know. All these radical Republicans thought Johnson was their savior. Even at the very end of Lincoln's life, one of them, a senator from Ohio, Benjamin Wade, comes up to Johnson and says, you know, I, I hope he is assassinated and you'll become president <sighs> because they, they think he'll be more vindictive. What they find out very quickly is that Johnson's not a race warrior. He, by the way, deserves credit. He's the only Southern Democratic senator who refuses to secede. And that's why he made so much sense on the ticket. National Unity ticket, which was what the the party uh, Lincoln's uh, re reelection party was called, um, but 
It turns out he's not a race warrior. He's a class warrior. He's motivated by his resentments to the planter class. But very quickly, he does what Lincoln uh, refused to do. He's, he, he, he almost willfully misinterprets Lincoln's desire for, re, uh, for reconciliation at the expense of ensuring that the upper echelon, the Confederate leadership, the people who, who knew better, that Lincoln made very clear, you know, he wanted to, you know, he was fine giving amnesty to the rank and file. They'd been misled. Most of them weren't slave owners. But to, to the planter class and the members of Congress and the members of the cabinet and the members of the Supreme Court who abandoned the and the generals who abandoned the Union to join the Confederacy, they could not be allowed to simply immediately reclaim their, their power. That was the line that Lincoln felt was too far. Johnson capitulated to the Confederacy almost immediately. And so much to my surprise, I mean, you begin seeing black club, black codes, which is basically slavery without the chains being legislated on the state level throughout the South in the fall, late summer mm-hmm. of 1865. So it's the worst of both worlds. And it results in, in a compounding tragedy. We didn't win the peace largely because of Andrew Johnson. And so we wrestled uh, with, with segregation and Jim Crow and, and the legacies uh, for, for a full century with the lost cause mythology. Grant deserves a lot of credit for trying to get us back on the Lincoln path. The anti-KKK acts and his uh, and their and their prosecution by a Southern attorney general, Amos T. Ackerman, is inspired, but it's ultimately not sufficient. So the John, Johnson, and by the way, was also as you know overtly racist as any president we have ever had. Oh God, um, yeah. I mean, it's just kind of, it's actually really stunning to see his language, the kind of language that, that he used. So the radical uh, Republicans, um, the, the the abolitionists, were able to push through over his vetoes, were able to push through Reconstruction, um, you know, much tougher Reconstruction efforts. So talk to me about Grant. You, you you know, that that Grant tried in some ways to, what, straddle between the, the Johnson appeasement and the vision of the radical Republicans was, was he in, you, you would argue that he was in line with, with what Lincoln would have intended? I think very much so. I mean, Grant has unique insight into Lincoln's vision because, um, I mean, the, the terms of surrender at Appomattox, which itself is an extraordinary moment, Grant is writing out those, the terms of surrender and he's he's almost taking mental dictation from everything Lincoln has told him, particularly over the past week when they were on the River Queen together. Days before Lincoln had sat with him for over an hour on a porch in Petersburg, Virginia, mm-hmm. and just reiterated over and over uh, his vision for a peace and the terms of peace. And so Appomattox is is very much a translation of Lincoln's vision. So Grant has that in mind. And he also knows from being at the last cabinet meeting the day that Lincoln is assassinated, that, you know, how much he he wants a liberal and honorable peace. He wants liberal and honorable terms to be given to the rank and file. Um, he wants to, and he's set up a series of structures to try to depolarize the tensions between the North and the South by moving the nation's attention West economically. But um, he also knows that Lincoln is terribly afraid uh, or concerned that if, if there is a vacuum, if, if law and order is not reestablished in the South, that it will create a vacuum within which the vigilantes will ride and extend terror. And so there's a question of winning the peace depends upon securing the gains militarily, politically, economically, and then having cultural integration on top of that. It's what some peace negotiators call a horizon of reconciliation, something to steer towards. And so Grant has that very much in mind. And, and you see that in particular, not only with his championing of the 15th Amendment to give African-American men the right to vote finally, but in the anti-KKK laws uh, that he passes through Congress. And he goes directly to Congress in person to lobby for. And then he has a Southern attorney general, as I mentioned, Amos T. Ackerman, who, who fought briefly for the Confederacy, implement those laws and those prosecutions. And they do beat back the first incarnation of the KKK. But mm-hmm. of course, it's a short-lived victory. Well, and then, of course, you describe how Lincoln's vision of Reconstruction is abandoned in that corrupt bargain um, mm-hmm. of the 1876 election, since, you know, we talk, we've been talking about stolen elections lately. Uh, Rutherford <laughs> B. Hayes, um, you know, becomes president, uh, is part of this deal that embraced unification at the expense of racial justice. So the deal was uh, Hayes becomes president, you're going to withdraw all the troops, Reconstruction is pretty much over, and that ushers in a century of segregation in Jim Crow. Yeah, 
Look, I think that the history of Reconstruction is, is particularly resonant right now with a lot of the themes we're dealing with in our yeah. country. Most of all, it's a reminder that <laughs> uh, the arc of history does not bend inevitably <laughs> towards <No>. justice. <laughs> Basic rights can be rolled back. And and one of the reasons I'm so passionate about applied history as kind of a counterpoint to uh, current events is is it provides us useful lessons that we can learn, that we need to learn, that we forget at our own peril. You know, the redeemers come in, and it, it's extraordinary. Southern Democrats, but Southern you know conservative populists who want to reclaim power, reassert white supremacy. They have the fact of the Fifteenth Amendment and the Thirteenth Amendment to deal with. But they, they go about subverting it through voter intimidation, voter suppression, vi enormous violence, as well as election subversion. They abuse the gerrymandering uh, processes mm -hmm. in, uh, in, you know, after the 1870 census. Um, they start cutting public funding for institutions from public hospitals to universities that are integrated. They start gutting them, even though the South desperately needs money to rebuild after the devastation of the Civil War. And, and, and of course, they do it, as the Confederacy did, often under the, the logic or the rhetoric of, of liberty and constitutional liberty. And they give birth to, to the lost cause mythology, which is the South was a noble cause and they never really lost. All those things, when we, when we confront the echoes of those arguments today, we owe it to ourselves to be deeply skeptical and armed with an awareness of history to see how those arguments have been misused and abused and have rolled back rights in the past. So, again, your book talks about the long tail of his his influence. Talk to me about uh, Woodrow Wilson um, and, and his influence, uh, the way that he was influenced by Lincoln, because you point out that, that he attempted to secure a peace among equals after the First World War but then deviated from uh, Lincoln's principle of unconditional surrender before an armistice. I mean, yeah. so there was, in, 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 in some ways, then ratifying many years after the fact that uh, Lincoln, Lincoln under, really understood what he was doing and how crucial it was that you had unconditional surrender before you had the just peace. That, that's exactly right. And I know some folks may be listening to this and saying, you know, how does he get to Treaty of Versailles and Woodrow Wilson in a book about Abraham Lincoln? And as in my last book, Washington's Farewell, I'm always really interested in the afterlife of the idea, um, how the ideas are, are applied or misapplied and, and vindicated over time. And what's fascinating about Woodrow Wilson is, I mean, he's the only American president to grow up in a state that lost a war. And, and the experience of being a child of the Confederacy and of, of Reconstruction and really suffering humiliation in the aftermath affects him enormously on an emotional level. And so in addition to uh, birthing sort of the bigotry that that uh, it sort of empowered slash enabled him to resegregate the federal government as president, which is obviously counter to his reputation at the time as a great progressive in a fundamental way. But, you know, it is clearly motivating his call for, as you say, a peace among equals, a peace without victory, which is a speech he gives to Congress. He, he wants a new conception uh, of what it means to, to win a war in this context of a war to make the world safe for democracy. And, and, so on the one hand, he he is is not he is decidedly not focused on vengeance. He understands the cycle of violence he's trying to stop, and Lincoln it has a, a huge psychic role in all the the Allied leaders after the First World War. I mean, Clemenceau actually, the French Prime Minister, had worked as a reporter covering Reconstruction mm -hmm. as a young man. It's extraordinary. David Lloyd George was obsessed with Lincoln, had a portrait over his mantle as a child and quoted Lincoln all the time, particularly while trying to get the U.S. into the war. And so Wilson comes in, he strides in with his 14 points, and the U.S. gets involved Germany surrenders. They think they're going to get better terms from Wilson that, than anybody else. And here's, here's the key departure from Lincoln's vision. He allows a ceasefire before surrender. He allows an armistice. And that is that shows, I think, the brilliance of Lincoln's insistence of doing things in the right order. The Germans never really accept defeat. That ends up nurturing its own lost cause mythology, which takes the form of Adolf Hitler. The, the, the allies are the other allies are in the mood for revenge. <laughs> they, they impose punishing reparations, which having suffered from a bout of, of the Spanish, uh, the Spanish influenza, which was never publicly disclosed. Uh, Wilson actually gives away in an attempt to secure the League of Nations, but he never does the work of creating bipartisan support 
<laughs> for, for the League of Nations, the Republican. He doesn't invite Republicans to accompany him to Paris. And so the whole thing comes crashing down. It becomes, as was warned at the time, a, a, not at peace, but an armistice for 20 years. And so in many ways, the Treaty of Versailles is an example of how not to win the peace. But the World War II generation was both inspired by Lincoln, uh, particularly in its form, his formulation of unconditional surrender followed by magnanimous peace. And that's why I go deep into these the occupations of Germany, Japan, and the Marshall Plan. Well, let's go back. Uh, let me go back to Woodrow Wilson for just sure, a moment. Sure, sure. Because, because he also had a, a, a complex uh, relationship with with the Civil War and Reconstruction. Oh, um, boy, he did. Because I'm, of course, the, the, the famous story that he aired, uh, Birth of a Nation, about the Ku Klux Klan in mm-hmm. the White House, and sort of had a kind of revisionist lost cause view of all of that. So he was a, he certainly must have had a somewhat ambivalent view of, of Lincoln and the Civil War in the North and the South. Well, it's interesting. It's not ambivalent, but he makes a real journey. When he enters college, Princeton as a young man, he, he is very much motivated by resentment toward the North and the Yankees and Lincoln. But in his process of, of getting a, a, a doctorate in political science, he grows to really appreciate and admire Lincoln. And there's, there's a quote to him where he says, you know, it's because I'm a proud Southerner that I rejoice in the defeat of the Confederacy. He writes articles in the Atlantic praising Lincoln's management style and his vision for reconstruction as he mm-hmm. saw it, which he thought would be far more, more moderate and wise. And, and, and it's because Lincoln did. I mean, he, he, he did continue to have a, a vision of, of federalism that informed his approach to reconstruction. As long as he got the big things right, he wanted buy-in on the local level. And his gradualism did have a grandeur to it because he wanted to figure out how to create sustainable change. And that's what wasn't done. But Wilson is a, a product of his childhood. I mean, his father had, was a Presbyterian minister who'd been writing biblical defenses of slavery. And, and so, yeah, I mean, he doesn't, you know, he grows to admire Lincoln, but he never buys into the the idea of, of reconciliation within within races huh. or a multiracial democracy. He's preoccupied by reconciling the North and the South at the expense of African Americans. You know, it's funny. I, I interrupt you going. I want to talk about the World War II and, and and Truman and Lucius Clay, but it 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 does strike me. You know how history's verdict is is uh, is is changing because I remember certainly as a young man the first time that. You know, I heard about Woodrow Wilson. He, at that time, he was considered one of the great American presidents. There was a movie that won up, you know, I think uh, won the Academy <laughs> Award about Wilson. Yeah. And 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 yet now you look back on him and you just described, you know, some of his many failures in foreign policy and domestic policy, you know, his his racism. It is interesting how at one time he was considered, he was really up on a pedestal. And um, it will be interesting, you know, over the next several decades, the revision of the view of Woodrow Wilson, because my, my guess is that he is not going to retain that status um, for very long, oh, if God. he still does in any way. Well, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm a big believer that you need to understand historical figures yeah. in the context of their time. That said, um, I mean, there, there's a fascinating moment where Lincoln um, goes to Richmond and he's outside a, a an infamous prisoner of war place called the the Libby. It was uh, basically a warehouse where Union officers had been held and now Confederates were in. And an angry mob uh, encircles him and says, tear it down. (laughs) And he's standing in his carriage with Tad, his son. And and he he raises his hand and says, no, don't tear it down. Leave it as a monument. And, and, And I think that makes a real powerful case for why we need to understand history and, and, and retain history. And that doesn't apply to Confederate statues that were put up in 1970 to Nathan Bedford Forrest and, you know, in the Tennessee state Capitol, by the way. But um, the, the way that we engage with history, yeah, Wilson was, it's important to understand why he was so widely admired by F, the generation of FDR and Truman, but also to, you know, understand the fact the guy resegregated the federal government. So you need to see the good with the bad and, 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 and we should be cautious about, you know, speaking of moral humility, applying moral absolutes on our history. We need to understand these figures as they are, but do it in a way that understands the good, the bad, and the ugly. All three can exist. So back to, I, I think one of the original points you, you make in this book um, that really struck me was the way you, you connect Lincoln's approach to uh, the just peace following the just war and the need for reconciliation with the approach after World War II, because as you point out, Harry Truman, you know, becomes president in the final months of World War II. 
and followed Lincoln's prescription of unconditional uh, surrender and a magnanimous peace, obviously culminating in the success of the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan continued to be one of the rather remarkable uh, moments in quasi-modern history. And the fact that you sort of uh, link that back to Lincoln's inspiration, I had never, I've never, that never occurred to me before. That's a very, I thought that was a very interesting insight. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I, I like I like synthesizing different yeah. a, a aspects of history and looking for the, the through line. What's interesting is that Truman is, is himself the grandson of sort of Confederate sympathizers. So he grew up a little bit more emotional distance with the resentments and emotional scars of the Civil War. And so he says, you know, when he's coming up with his vision for securing the peace, which as a young soldier after the First World War, he knows had not done, uh, you know, successfully. You know, he says very clearly, I didn't want hate to be our generation's gift to the next. And and so he's thinking not only in terms of implementing the reconstructions and doing the opposite of reparations for Germany and Japan, but the Marshall Plan itself is a fascinating, um, the process he engages in speaks a lot about the lessons of Lincoln and the mistakes of Woodrow Wilson. Some people say, look, you're proposing a massive investment. In, in Europe, including Germany, uh, to stabilize it after the Second World War, when most people are excited for a peace dividend. But, you know, it's really defining, you know, you got the Truman Doctrine, this should be the Truman Plan. Truman says, no, don't put my name on it. It'll quiver a couple of times and die on Capitol Hill. Put George Marshall's name on it, the general turned Secretary <laughs> of State. And that's how it becomes the Marshall Plan. The other crucial thing is, in contrast to what Wilson did with the League of Nations, Truman and Marshall begin very early on selling it to and making it a partnership with Arthur Vandenberg, the influential Republican uh, uh, senator from Michigan, who was chairman of uh, the Foreign uh, Foreign Relations Committee. Um, And and, and he comes on board, and he had been a staunch isolationist before Pearl Harbor, but he really came aboard and understood, you know, he's often credited with that famous saying, we can never remember too much, you know, partisan politics ought to end at the water's edge with regard to a more united foreign policy in the U.S. And and so by getting Vandenberg's buy-in early on, um, and they really engage in a process of selling it, uh, despite the fact that Republicans briefly controlled Congress at the time, yeah. they were able to pass the Marshall Plan and implement it. And it is still, I mean, the most extraordinary act of enlightened self-interest. And it worked. That unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace worked. And you can see Lincoln's inspiration through it all, because he really was synonymous with with that generosity of spirit, that that investment in peace. And it's just a reminder, what I think is the overall message of, of the book. I mean, I hope it's a great story, mm-hmm. but peace needs to be waged with an intensity that rivals war. Lincoln understood that. It's not a static state. It can't be understood in isolation. If you don't win the peace, you don't really win the war. You know, and I, again, I was reminded how, and, and, and really the heart of your whole account is this 701 word speech, the second inaugural address, uh, obviously probably the most famous <laughs> inaugural address ever given by a president, only 700 words. And, and as you point out, it, it, it kicked off the most consequential six weeks in American history. It is such a remarkable document for what it shows about Abraham Lincoln's character, about his mind, the clarity with which he's, you know, removed any doubt about the true cause of the war. He made mm-hmm. it very explicit. It was about slavery, despite all the revisionism that would would come later, because as you point out, truth needed to precede reconciliation. Um, you know, to, to imagine a president giving a 701 word speech now is inconceivable to imagine a president <laughs> Writing some a document like this now is is really hard to imagine. I mean, it's that, almost, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's almost impossible because it it has a theological weight to yeah. it, which some right. of the people listening understood. It is an extraordinary speech, and I come to this as I did with Washington's farewell as, as being a former mm-hmm. speechwriter. So I, I like the close reading of the texts. But this is a remarkable document for all the reasons you state. And, and it, it employs a lot of Lincoln's you know, favorite devices, you know, drawing on the past to illuminate the president, set a course for the future. But it's the quick pivot in the final paragraph that goes from really an Old Testament view of the war being 
collective punishment for the original sin of slavery. And, and him, even despite being president during a civil war, he, he, he doesn't engage in us versus them. He never demonizes the people he disagrees with. He talks about it's a common punishment because the North, he felt, was responsible for the slavery as the South, at least in as much as we provided markets for the, the rice and the cotton. You know, so, so we couldn't feel secure in our moral superiority, certainly not as a precondition to real reconciliation. But that final paragraph, the first words of which are so famous, you know, with malice toward mm-hmm. none, with charity for all, the entire paragraph... The, the, the rhythm and the depth, he is, he is presenting a vision of what a redeemed nation would look like on the road to achieving and cherishing a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. It is New Testament leadership that he is laying out. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's, it's the kind of speech, and in particular that paragraph, that you can't read too much. It is a, it is a moral challenge. Um, and I think offered up in that spirit of to form a more perfect union. It's a place we don't arrive at, uh, but it's that horizon of reconciliation that we must steer towards. And it's yeah, a challenge. It, 74 words, a final paragraph and a final sentence, 74 words. And really, it, it, it's, it's not just one of the great statements of American political history. It's really one of the, the uh, greatest uh, passages of, of American literature. So this leads me to a much, much more difficult question, John, <laughs> because see, Abraham Lincoln comes out of the probably the most politically divisive decade that we had experienced up until then, the 1850s, which a lot of people have been making analogies to now. Um, mm-hmm. The country was tearing itself apart about slavery. And of course, that led to the horrors of the Civil War in the 1860s. And I guess the question is, you know, his vision was that we need to break the fever through what we've been discussing, this policy of you know, mercy and reconciliation and, and, and truth. I'm sure you've thought about this because you've, you've spent your days going back and forth between this history and the reality. What will it take now? How optimistic are you or hopeful are you that we can find some formula to break the fever we're in now? Because the fever of the 1850s did not break without the horror of the Civil War. And even after the Civil War, you know, because Lincoln was not around, um, it took us maybe a century to solve some of the problems. So where are we at now? What do you, what is your view of where, you know, our, our current crisis and what it's going to take? Well, first let me say, I don't think it's going to take another civil war. And, and that should be a moral impossibility to even discuss. And we see talk of a second civil war and it just says such massive disrespect for the dead, for what our country went through. Mm -hmm. You got to remember that also America is the world's sole democracy at the time certainly on any major scale. There's never been a civil war on that scale. And part of what we need to recognize is the people who were preaching the virtue of a war as kind of a a cleansing conflict that would finally break the fever. They thought it would be short and they were wrong. And we, we do not need to do this again. Not that way. You ask if I'm optimistic. I, I, I think any read of history, even the most clear-eyed, which says you cannot take progress for granted, You need to wage peace. You need to fight for progress, but you need to think about how to make it sustainable, right? It's, you know, Lincoln's core insight is that, you know, you can't salt the fields of, of the South. You can't do that in democracy. You need to find a way to, to reunite. There's an apocryphal quote from Lincoln, which I love, which is, he said, allegedly, you know, I'm an optimist because I don't see the point in being anything else. And I think that's pretty stable ground, Mm -hmm. but it does mean that we need to be deeply cognizant of the larger forces we are playing with, and we need to think about ways to to depolarize. The interpersonal example of empathy itself is incredibly difficult. Lincoln's party would be unrecognizable to him. I mean, it is unfortunately, as you have documented so well, and I'm a great admirer of your work, as is my wife, uh, Margaret, and we, we are devoted listeners of, of the Bulwark podcast and the Hoovalon Thank household. You. Thank you. You know, we need two parties that are committed to democracy. We need to find an off-ramp from this polarization. And we are in a dangerous moment that can't be taken for granted. But it will require more reaching out. It will require uh, resh- reshaping and reconfiguring coalitions. 
Um, and, and, and it will require creating some structural offerings. I mean, one of the things the book's interested in is the process of securing a piece. But implicit in that is, you know, what are, what are the, the structural reforms that can provide a, a safety valve? Um, you know, I'm a big believer in, in open primaries and ranked choice voting and, and redistricting reform. That sounds wonky to some people, but, you know, the incentive structure is part of what's so terribly screwed up in our politics right now. But as long as we can take the longer view and not simply and, and remind people that we are in a process, process, we are defending our democracy, we are defending the idea of a majoritarian multiracial democracy, that over time, that vision will be vindicated, particularly if we can remember our shared history. And, and, and the presence of the second founding generation led by Lincoln, but also Frederick Douglass and Grant and so many others, I think provides a really powerful touchstone for us. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the interplay between the far left and the far right only drives us more, further apart, deeper into mutual distrust. So we need to find places of common ground and common good. And, and I think applied history uh, offers us that example. You were talking about this with Adam Kinzinger the other day, the yeah. importance of history as, as an example to which the just and honorable can repair. The idea that history is watching. So it's not just about your ego and your short-term self-interest. You have to think about America as a sacred trust that's bigger than us. And that's what Lincoln did. And that's the, the heart of citizenry in a democracy at the end of the day. The book is Lincoln and the Fight for Peace. It is out today. Ken Burns, the Academy Award nominated documentary filmmaker, calls it a stunning accomplishment and an essential reminder that the Civil War, the most important event in our country's history, is very much part of who we are as a people and a nation today. John Avalon, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking about your new book. And congratulations. Thank you very much. I've had a, a complete blast talking with you, Charlie. It's a great pleasure. And thank you for all the work you and your colleagues do. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again.